Assalamu alaikum and good morning from Gaza. This is English a poetry at the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, today we move to do something perhaps a little bit different from neoclassicism. But uh, don't be mistaken, this is not that much different from uh, metaphysical poetry or the poetry of, of, of John Donne. Unfortunately, when we read many, many English literature books, English poetry books, uh, they will tell you that uh, the real modernist movement started with the, with the Romantic poets, with the likes of William Blake, uh, Wordsworth, and, and, and Coleridge. This is true to, to some extent, but sadly this erases the likes of John Donne, who themselves were practicing this probably a hundred years uh, before the Romantics. Uh, we've seen how John Donne uh, categorically refused the rules of decorum, how he uh, put meaning over rule, how he didn't like the collective idealistic poetry of, uh, of the, Elizabethan, uh, the Elizabethan age. But with the, with, with the Romantics, we speak about totally, also in a way, totally different uh, poets in their sensibility, in their approach to individualism and the, the universe nature. If I want to draw a timeline, uh, a random timeline to see how uh, of, of neoclassicism. I usually claim that this is where perhaps John Donne was writing poetry. He was writing poetry during the heyday, the peak of neoclassicism. When people, the giants like um, Samuel Johnson and later on, the, the great names 50 years later, 100 years later, like um, we said Ben Johnson, Samuel, um, Samuel Johnson, and, and John Dryden, and Alexander Pope later on, were dominating the scene. For John Donne, it was, uh, it was swimming not against one current, but swimming against currents of, of giants, people who were already loved, who were writing some of the great, great literature, poetry in English. Uh, so it wasn't easy for him. And that's why this is the reason why he, to, to a great extent, was negatively framed, like we explained before, and largely kicked out of the English canon, was not taken seriously by, by many. If I want to talk about Romanticism, probably this is where they were writing, when neoclassicism was already in decline and people have already had enough of the same poetry being written in the same way, following the same rules, you know, rules of decorum, the subject matter, and the form, and, and uh, the language, etc. I'm not saying that the Romantics, much not suggesting that the Romantics had it easy, they didn't, because most of the Romantics, you would be surprised to know that they were not famous during their lifetimes. Again, there is this connection between them and, and the metaphysicals. Uh, the four great romantics, probably except for Shelley, almost all of them were not famous, were not taken sometimes seriously by, uh, by their time. We'll see this as, as we go. Today we begin with William. the one and only William Blake. Uh, William Blake wrote some of the most beautiful poetry in English. Uh, many people try, like to classify him as a different poet, a, diff a poet of his own, in his own world. Um, but others like to consider him as a pre-romantic, somebody who started, who pioneered this, who ushered this, and who influenced uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge uh, later on. So whether he is a romantic or a pre-romantic is not a big issue for us, but we'll find so many uh, similarities between him and Wordsworth and some other uh, romantic poets like even Shelley and, uh, and Keats. Now, uh, I don't want to speak much about him. I don't want to give you the background and the context. Let's see his poetry and then try to draw some uh, conclusions uh, or come up with uh, the features that we might find in his, in his poetry. This is a, a small, short poem by William Blake. Again, you already uh, studied this perhaps or read it before. A uh, small, short, beautiful, cute, crunchy poem. It's just eight lines, not only eight lines. Is this the shortest poem so far, this course? Yes. Perhaps yes, but also look at the lines. Short. Even short lines. Probably uh, if you count the syllables, you'll, you'll come across like five syllables, which is half the syllables we had in, yeah. in the sonnet and other, and other poems. So this is the sick rose. Oh, 
rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Somebody read, please. Howling storm. The howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson, crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Thank you very much. Please. O oh Rose, thou art sick. The invisible bird that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does, does thy life destroy. Okay. Can, can you focus on the tone? How would you? Uh, like, is this a celebratory poem? Is it sad, dark, happy, optimistic, pessimistic? So, can you capture this in the way you read? Yeah? Okay. So, how would you... Could you read it? Would you read it with this tone in mind? Okay, thank you very much. Very good. I think it's sad. It's not oh, Rose, thou, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy. joy. And his dark secret love is thy life destroyed. Okay, thank you very much. Very good readings. Now, if this is a short uh, story, a narrative, what type of narrator do we have here? First person, are you sure? Or, okay. Okay. That's not what what a first person narrator is. First person narrator is is die. So there's no I like, shall I compare thee, come live with me. And most poetry we studied already uh, is a first person narrator. Whether it is a personal experience like John Donne or a collective personal experience like, like the, the likes of Shakespeare, for example. So yeah, there is yes, you and your. But basically this is a poem that talks about something in the third person pronoun making it a third-person pronoun narrative. So the character is talking to somebody, true. There's some kind of dialogue with the other being silent. But also, the, 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 the persona, the speaker here, who is not a character in this text, unlike like in Shakespeare, shall I compare thee, the, the speaker is a, a character of the poem. Here, the speaker is, is not, it's basically an outside of the poem. And, and the second question I want to ask is, who are the characters here? Who are the characters? Okay, please, okay. Okay, you're saying arrows, like this. Arrow, like what, arrows? Or rose? Or the rose? Or the rose, would it make a difference? Yes. Yes. In, in the title it says, I'm not sure if this is the exact title, it says the sick rose, particular sick rose, but the first line says, oh rose, with a capital R. So if, if you're saying rose, somebody said rose, this is a name, somebody's name, right? Right? The rose with a capital here could arrows. It also a rose is possible. It could be, you say, for example, uh, grammatically speaking, you say, a Mr. Uh, Smith is waiting for you. So somebody whose name is Mr. Smith and you don't know this man before, the Mr. Smith, like he's the man and the one and only in a way. So this is the main character, 
and the worm. The, the worm. Are you sure? Yes. And so, okay, we have we have the worm. The speaker. The speaker is usually if in in a narrative. If it is a third person narrator, we don't count the third the narrator as one of the characters most most often. So, uh, the worm and the rose. That's very good. What about the timing, the setting? Before we come to talk more about this, what about the setting? The setting, sorry. It's taking place. It's taking place at night in the night. So, what's happening during this night? So probably this is winter, right? Because there is a storm that is not only a storm, but a howling storm. Look at the choice of word here. In a way, this is onomatopoeic. Howling. The sound that it's like a sound a storm could make in a poem, if not in real life. So a howling storm. It's dark, stormy, and the storm is very strong. Wind could be heard through the howling storm. Okay, what else is there in the poem? What else do you notice, like other than this, the, the place, the time, the, the setting? Uh, it is in the present time. Are you sure? Where is the the, the main tense? Okay, grammatically speaking. What sentences, how many sentences do we have here? Two. Two, where are they? First, stan first stanza, first line. First stanza is one sentence? No. Because here it says, O oh, rose thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm. Still a dependent clause. Dependent clause, because we have the subject we have the adjectival clause. So the first, please. Two sentences. Where are they? The first line is a sentence. Okay. And then there's this is one whole sentence. Three sentences, are you sure? Yeah. What is a sentence? Are are you sure? What what is a sentence? But this is a comma, Raf. But this is a comma. A, a, a sentence is a group of words with at least one main clause. A group of words that begin with a capital letter and end with a full stop. A full stop or a question mark sometimes or an exclamation mark like in this case. So this is one sentence, one simple sentence. Or rose, thou art sick. You are sick. You are sick. Sick. And I, I really can't understand exactly what, me, like, like imagine the situation here clearly, like is he, is, is he talking to the rose? Is the speaker, what is the speaker? Is the speaker, like because here we have, if you're saying a rose and a worm or the worm, it's the here, right? So is the speaker what, uh, a bird, a tree? Or is a human being? Like observing and saying, does the rose know she is sick? Is this warning? And of course, this is not sick like you're disgusting, you're, you're doing something horrible, and then are you sick? This is your pity, oh, you're sick. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. So the invisible worm, that's the subject. The worm is the subject, it's described as invisible. That which flies in the night, that flies in the night, this is uh, adjectival clause, but here we have uh, a prepositional phrase, yet another prepositional phrase, in the howling storm. The verb is has, found, out, object, thy bed, another prepositional phrase, of crimson joy. And then we have another independent clause. So this is a complex sentence, and this is a compound sentence, making it compound complex sentence plus one, one simple sentence. It's two sentences. And I like this. We remember with Shakespeare, we said every line is basically one statement. 
John Donne changed this, where the line could go on for three, four, five uh, uh, sentences and would, would jump from one stanza to the other. The poem in its totality makes its meaning rather than every line making uh, just one, one statement. Again, these are different styles. Doesn't mean this is better than that. But this one keeps you busy throughout the whole poem. Okay? It doesn't cut your, your train of thought. Okay, so we agree that this is was one simple sentence and then one compound complex. It, it gets complicated. The sentence that you say, but everything else gets complicated because things get inside others. I like how the worm is described and yet described again with a phrase and another phrase and then the verb and then the object and then another prepositional phrase. Things get inside each other. Interesting. What else do you notice? Other, other things about the poem. What do you find interesting, different, intriguing? Oh, okay. Okay, I, I go to the jump, to, I'll jump to the rhyme scheme. There is thick. A, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Should it be A? It, it, this is the K sound. Huh? So always A? Okay, good. Always A. And then, and then worm? B. And then night? C. And storm? Possibly another? B. Not 100%. But still. Now, I know, like I told you before, that people would continue with the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. But I like doing it differently, where we go back to the alphabet with every new stanza. Because sometimes you have long poems, and then you run out of letters, and then what should I do next? Different scenarios. Okay? So go back again to the rhyme scheme. We have here A, B, C, are you sure? Joy, oi, destroy. Another B. So uh, this makes it easier when you say a poem that rhymes perfectly. Two, two stanzas, A, B, C, B, A, B, C, B. Rather than saying A, B, C, B, D, E, uh, F, E, or whatever. Okay. So rhyme scheme is it's perfect. What else do you notice? Please. Thank you very much. Look at the simple words. I'm not sure which word you checked using, uh, you used the dictionary to check to understand. How many words did you check? Honestly, those of you who looked at the, the point. That's the word crimson. Okay, and? Howling. If, even if you don't know what howling is, you can always guess because Usually, we don't say a calm sto storm. It's usually a storm is, you know, windy, stormy, st strong, powerful. So a howling storm. And then crimson, possibly. So only, and again, you're not native speaker. So if you don't know one or two words, that's still a good achievement. But it means that this man is using simple language simplicity of language. Remember the neoclassicists who would always, every couple of lines, they would send you rushing to the dictionary, checking the meaning, and even going googling stuff to understand what he means by, by these references and these allusions and translating this Latin and translating this Greek and understanding why he's intertexting with Horace and everything. You come to the poem and you stay for the poem. Unlike the neoclassicists where usually you come for the poem and then you rush out uh, to, to dictionaries and the internet and then you come back and go on and on. Simple language. That's very good. Very good thing to notice. Please. Um, the number of syllables are not the same in English, so they each last. Okay, but I'll... Generally are five. Okay, I'll come to this, but again, let's uh, move gradually, uh, Roseanne. What about the words, the, the choice of words? Tell me this word is interesting, for example, or that word, this phrase is interesting. What things do you find interesting? I think it is all of symbolism, right? Yeah, we'll come to symbolism. Like, again, it's always better to work gradually. Look at the poem, notice the shape and the form, and then look at individual words. So what 
uh, does every individual word uh, inspire in you or what does it connote? And then you go for, for example, reading the poem, trying to understand. We'll do this. We try to link everything to a possible reading the poem. Do, is there one word or one phrase you find interesting, like we did with, for example, here, the howling storm or other words? Uh, it's giving a bad image of what we already Again, know. my question is, one particular word, one particular phrase, we're not going to comment on the meaning now. We're, we're working step what by step. A worm is beautiful. Do you like worms? Worms? Ah, that's because you, you, you're, reading, you're reading it warm. It's not warm. And it's a character. It's a thing. It's a creature. So is, is worm good or bad? Positive or negative? Ah. Thank you. At least it is, even if worm is good, it is what... It what is making the the, the rose sick? And and the, and the worm is described as oh, yeah. that's a very good word. So it's not only dark and winter and cold and stormy and howling. This creature, the cause of this sickness, is working invisibly. Is not is invisible. What does it mean invisible? Because because it's, it's like is the, 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 the worm in disguise, disguising? Is it a close, is it a family member? Is it somebody you trust, somebody you try, you seek safety, security, and protection from, and then it turns out that this person, this thing is the very opposite of what you think. The person you seek, who's uh, uh, the thing, the person you, whose protection and, and, and stuff you seek is the very reason for your destruction. That's invisible. What does it mean? What does it indicate? Why is it invisible? Other words. We'll come back again to wrap things up. What other words do you find peculiar? Yep. When you said invisible, it is interesting that he uh, called his love as a dark and secret love. Okay. So we jump uh, to the kind of love. There is love. Well, love is good, right? Yeah. Oh, Rose, thou art sick. Blah, blah, night, visible worm, howling storm. But then there is love. If you look at the, the poem from afar, you see the word love could give you a, a good impression. Against the mostly negative words, sick. Rose is good, yeah? But this is a rose that is sick. There's a worm that is invisible. It's night. It's, a sto it's a stormy. And it's howling. And then there is love. But this is not an ordinary love. This is a love that is... Number one, Dark. first, secret. it's secret. Is it like, one-sided, unreciprocated love? Toxic. But why is it secret? When is love secret? When it is harming, like destroying its life. Okay. And the thing is that it's, it's dark. Like, say, say hey to khalasna, or la. Why would you say, is dark love, love? So you're saying this, is, it, this means unhealthy love. Unhealthy love. For example, the character of the worm. Like, let's, let's, for example, consider, that, consider the, the rose as a woman and the, the worm as a man. He could be an impressive person. He loves her, but he's impressive mm. at the same time. So that's going to destroy her life. Mm -hmm. So and would, would you, dark secret love, we could mean unhealthy would you, love. Do you think that toxic people, toxic lovers understand this? They know that they're not doing a good job, that they're being abusive no, and everything. It's their nature. They don't know that, that what they're doing is, is unhealthy, but it is unhealthy. Hmm. This is why it's invisible. That's why it's invisible? Invisible to whom? It's invisible to the To the rose? To the persona, the speaker, the speaker knows. The speaker is diagnosing everything. The speaker is all-knowing. He's a third-person narrator. He knows that this, this, there is a worm that is flying and that is in, invisible. I think it is guessing. Like when he saw the rose sick after the night, he guessed like there is a worm. Is there an indication in the text that the speaker is the, the guessing? No. Yes, it is invisible, so he didn't see it. So he knows. Oh. He knows. 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 He
or probably invisible to the rose. But yeah, you, th these are all valid points. We don't have, and it's again the beauty of poetry, this is the beauty of even the romantics. It's, a, it's an extra feature we have in romanticism. You, you can talk about a poem for, for a year and have different opinions and, and everything. There are many gaps. These are poems that encourage us to think, to link, try to make up our mind and then something shows up and then, yeah, possibly the other reading is, is, also, is also valid. So this is a love that is secret, but it's also a love that is dark, destructive. What else? There's one word, one key word that is significant that you haven't highlighted. Hmm. There's one word here that is also, other than the ones we highlighted, a word we didn't highlight. I, okay, Mash, I, I like that you, you, you paid attention to his, yeah. But you're, you're saying that she is a woman because the worm is a he, not necessary, but Rose is, is usually taken as feminine. This is, I think this is a key word in the whole poem. <coughs> He could have simply said, it. It. Does it make a difference that the worm is a he? In what sense? He's also personifying the rose, don't forget. Okay. We're saying here that you are sick and you do not know that there is an invisible worm. That is the why, why is the worm a he? The worm is a he because he wants to give it a, the treats of people, of okay. human beings. Like they are deceptive. They why are isn't the, the worm another, another she? Another she. Mm -hmm. oh, please. We can consider his, uh, it's written to, to worm because uh, here it is. Say again. Yeah, his refers to a, yeah? yeah? Do I agree on this or? Okay, so? Because here, uh, uh, the poet wants to, to say that his dark, maybe, maybe the rest, she doesn't know about this love. Uh, she, she doesn't even know that she is sick. Uh, because he say, oh, Rose, thou art sick. I know that you are sick, but you, you, you don't know that. Okay. Why is the worm a he? Okay, thank you very much. I think he used his to, to indicate that the, 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 the whole poem is like deeper than uh, a, a relationship between a rose and a worm. He mm. is indicating the relationship between a woman and a man. Okay, so you're taking this symbolically. He's yeah. personifying if he's personifying. If he said, by the way, if he said it referring to the worm, we would also guess that this is a man mm. and a woman. But he's making it clearer yeah. to us yeah. that yeah. this is a his, where yeah. the man is the cause of the destruction, man. Mm -hmm. If you want to take it symbolically, we'll, we'll come to this uh, in a bit. Uh, that man, it, it, probably man, not only man, that, that's masculinity. If you're talking about an abusive relationship. Uh, if not masculinity, perhaps it's about the patriarchal society as a whole. The man-made society, the society controlled by men and made for men, where women are silent, silenced, and shushed all the time. Please. But he, okay, like, but human soul, what I, he's taking, he's focusing on, like he's saying, okay, there are the human soul, there's the man and there's the woman. The woman is sick because of the other half of, the, of humanity, because of man. I think he too falls into the stereotypes of like masculinity and femininity. Because like he's, he's also portraying the rose as naive and doesn't know that she's sick. And That's true. See. So, and so like he, he's associating what is naive and innocent so women cannot represent themselves, cannot speak for themselves. They should be represented. They don't even know when they are in, in, in a mess like this. He is informing her, please. I think this, this poem goes beyond a relationship between a man and a woman. I think he's actually lamenting the loss of innocence in any certain mm. But there's nothing wrong even with taking it 
uh, on this particular level, on man-woman relationship. Uh. Okay. Okay. Now we'll come now to the symbolism. But somebody said something about the number of syllables. Uh, okay. Uh, How many syllables do we have in line number one? Five. 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 Yeah. Usually, if you have uh, five, it means there are two feet, because some feet consist of three syllables. Yes, most feet consist of two syllables, but some of them consist of three syllables. So we'll take this as, you know, as two, two feet. L line number two, how many, how many syllables? Are you sure? Say again, the, in, v, z, bel, worm. Okay, three feet, and then? Five. That flies in the night. Five. In the how? Ling storm, five. also five, and then has found out thy bed, five, five syllables four. of crimson joy, four. Hmm. four, and then his dark and his dark secret love, and then finally, does thy life destroy? Five. Of course, irregular. Going from four to five to five to six to four to five. Does this make uh, the sick rose any any list of any uh, of, a, of a poem? It doesn't it doesn't make it unpoetic. Does it lose some of its poeticality, some of its beauty, because it doesn't conform? It doesn't obey the the, the rules of decorum. Now. Uh, We'll talk about this in, in a bit, uh, how what the romantics uh, think about the rules of decorum. And I'm sure that the likes of Alexander Pope methodized and systematized, speaking about rules, uh, Dryden and those people will be pulling their hair now that those people are like, sorry, this is not the way uh, we should be, do poetry. This is the way we, how we should do poetry. So what about the symbolism? What does the poem stand for, which is the key issue in the poem, like thinking of this, thinking of the words, the negative words, even the, the, the one beautiful word here is negative, the rose itself or herself, you see. So what do you think? What does the rose symbolize? Please. This doesn't apply to William Blake. William Blake was a Londoner. He lived in London. He stayed in London. And some say he even loves London, despite the fact that he was severely critical of London and the life there. So what does the rose in, in specific symbolize? Please. I think this word uh, symbolizes... Uh, One thing. Stop counting. Do this. Yeah. Love. Okay. The, the rose symbolizes love, where... One half of this relationship, love relationship, is sick, destroyed, and the other half is causing this destruction. So, um, thank you, interesting. I think the rose also, stop counting. Oh, One. Okay. So, okay, you think that the, the word rose symbolizes nature. What is destroying nature in your sense? What is man? Please. Um, you know, that, yeah, sometimes you feel he's, he loves London, sometimes you, you think he, you, you, you realize that he hates London, he doesn't maybe, like maybe it. The, the worm is the, the same life and the rose is himself. He, him, oh, oh yeah, oh, okay. So ro he's rose, he's, it's like, you know, the Da Vinci uh, painting, some people think that this was a self-portrait, Da Vinci drawing himself, the Mona Lisa, uh -huh, right? Yeah. So this could be, oh, rose, looking in the mirror and, you know, liking himself and they said, oh. <laughs> It's the city that destroyed me. I like this. Thank you very much. Please. So this is innocence, and this is experience. We'll talk about innocence experience in, in a bit. Please. The worm is life. The, the, the rose is life in general. Please. I guess 
stop counting. One thing. Beauty. So if, if, if beauty can be destroyed by what? What's the worm here if this is beauty? If, if this is beauty, what is, what is the worm? Makeup? <laughs> or food? Uh, getting old. Getting age, thank you. Age. Okay, I find this far-fetched, but also I like it. I like it. If you want to take this, the whole poem is symbolic and also parody. Yes, people love poetry because of rules of, uh, rules of the Quran, but at the same time, this is dark and this is not real love. This is toxic. This is toxic, toxic because it's repressive and restrictive. It, it prevents you from expressing yourself being yourself. I think rose does not destroy the Ro Ro Rose? The rules. I think sometimes they do. Sometimes we do. Uh, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. Again, this is up to you whether you want to like classical poetry, whether in Arabic or English, whether you like uh, classical poetry more than metaphysical or romantic poetry, free verse, blank verse, or vice versa. This is a personal uh, uh, preference. Please. I think we can also say that the howling storm symbolizes life. Oh, okay. In this sense, what is rose? What is the worm? No, in a sense, experience life. Okay. So life, innocence, and an experience. Now look at this. Please, finally, yeah. So you're connecting it with this understanding that this could be about the repressive rules, the invasive rules of, of life, of modern life, of the city, controlling and limiting our imagination. Thank you. Like what? Okay, what else? Who usually depend on others in the society, in our life? Okay. Oh, 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 don't say that the rose is students and the worm is a teacher. <laughs> okay? Maybe it's vice versa. Maybe we are, you know. We are sick because of the invisible worms destroying us. Ah. Assignments? What are the assignments? The howling storm? Oh, in this sense, this, this oxymoron here, you know, it's like, like Hamlet says, tough love, you know, cruel to be kind. So this is... <laughs> Okay, I like how this poem is helping you, you know, use your imagination even more. With, with, the, with, the, with the necklaces, it's usually, the, sometimes you feel that they have one idea, one thing to teach in a poem. To teach and delight, right? Mm -hmm. But with the romantics, you'll come to uh, a reality where a poem could mean many things. And, if, and I think all your understandings and interpretations are valid here. But we can also take this poem to today. I remember last year one of the students was saying, this is, uh, this is women now on social media, you know. Sometimes men, you know, take advantage, try to take advantage of women, of their innocence, of their, you know, and they try to destroy their lives. I like this interpretation. The other day a student was saying, the rose is Palestine, the worm is the Zionist entity, coming to Palestine, destroying Palestine, and that is also valid. But there are two things here. We don't want to mix things. Uh, for William Blake, yes, this could be taken as, uh, some might suggest that the rose is probably an actual rose. He was walking down the road, I don't know, somewhere in London, and he found a rose where there is a worm, and that he made a fuss out of all of this. Or well, the rose could symbolize nature. What could symbolize life in the city and how it was destroyed by the industrial revolution and the factories and the pollution, somebody said here. Or it could mean some woman, a woman he knows, or women in general, or children. I, I expected some of you to say children, but there's no much uh, indication here. But this could be about or a child or childhood or innocence and experience or beauty or nature or the countryside and how it's being destroyed by... Now, what is it about? I think it's about all of these. And I think this is a feature of romanticism, imagination. Encouraging imagination, 
encouraging using your, uh, 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 your, your mind, not to think intellectually, to find facts, to create facts about this, but to imagine how things could be, how things can be. The fact that the poem offers so many possibilities is the very opposite of neoclassical literature where usually there's one understanding, one main understanding of the text. This is what it is, it's like mathematics. In a sense, I don't want to be extreme. But here, there are so many possibilities for the same, for, for one poem. So if, if any of your exam asks you, what is uh, 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 the, the, the rose a symbol of, you could say, whatever you like, as long as you support your, 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 your argument with you know, things about Blake or things from, from the book. But don't go too far to taking it to say this, it stands for Palestine or Facebook and you know. This, what I mean here is that you could post this poem, you could have this Photoshop design and put a picture of the Dome of the Rock or a map of Palestine and write this and it, it works and say, oh Rose, thou art sick the invisible worm. You could uh, say this to uh, somebody who has been in a toxic relationship, like trying to cheer them up, I don't know, tell them it has been happening. But remember, I don't care about the, the authorial intention. I don't care what he intended, uh, William Blake. He could have intended all these things you just, you just mentioned. Now, uh, in the remaining time, I want you to see this other beautiful poem by William Blake. William Blake was uh, very famous for uh, 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 like uh, two groups or two volumes of poetry entitled Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, where he talks about the two statuses of life. Sometimes the, the same experience is looked at because he believes in uh, the fact that the world is our own perception. We create the world, the world, we create it. How we see the world is what the world is. And you see it, I'll quote him in a bit. He, he says, both read the Bible uh, day and night, uh, thou so uh, dark, I so light. It's the same Bible, different people, different understanding and perception. And in a way, but again, this is extreme to some extent, the world being our own perception. So in the Songs of Innocence, we find, for example, the chimney a poem about the chimney sweeper in Innocence from the perspective of the children, how things are from how the kids uh, see things. And then we'll have, we'll have a chimney sweeper from an experience point of view where see, the poem focuses on the corruption and the destruction of life and innocence and childhood in the, in the poem. The same thing happens here. We have two poems, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. I'm sorry this doesn't fit the whole poem. The first poem, the Innocence poem, is actually four stanzas. I'll read it very quickly. When the voices of children are heard on the green, look at how long it is. Children, the green extends. And then the voice of children, what happens here? Not only the voices, also laughing is heard on the hill. My heart is at, is, at, it is at rest within my breast. This brings me joy and rest and happiness because of the kids playing and laughing, having fun, and everything else is still. These are the most important things here. Then look at the quote. So this is probably the nurse. Then come home, my children. The sun is, is gone down and the dews of night arise. Come, come, leave off play, and let us away till the morning appears in the skies. So come back home, and then you could come back to play tomorrow. It's not the end of the day. It's literally the end of the day, but it's not the end of everything. You can, it's a circle, you keep going on to play. I have no problem with that. So this is the nurse, first describing what's going on, and then because it's, the sun is gone down, come, come. The sun is gone, let, uh, leave off play and let us away till the morning appears in the skies. 
And then the kids also, this is a quote, speaking back, talking back. No, no, let us play for it is yet day. It is still day, Father. And we can't go to, we cannot go to sleep. Besides, in the sky little birds fly. There are still birds out there. And the hills are all covered with sheep. So people are out there, life is there, nature is there. Why would you go, would take us back home? Well, well, and this is the, again, the, the nurse. Well, well, go and play till the light fades away. And then go home to bed. That's the end of, again, the speech here, the dialogue. Look at the dialogue. You will not find this dialogic thing in neoclassical, this much of dialogism in, in neoclassical uh, poetry. The little ones leaped and shouted and laughed and all the hills echoed. Nature is laughing back. Very simple poem, yeah? It's very simple. Kids playing, come back home. No, we're not coming back home. There's still, you know, birds and sheep out there. So, okay, play some more, like one more hour, 30 minutes more, and then when the light fades away, come back home. Look at this poem. Okay. This is the same uh, experience, the same uh, story from a different point of view. Experience. The nurse's song, Experience. The first thing is that this is the whole poem. Two syllables, two, two stanzas. It's 50%, it's half the song of innocence. When voices of children are heard on the green, the very same first line. And and not laughing and giggling and playing and sounds and naughtiness, whispering. Now there is, why would we whisper? So either a secret or there's fear. You're not, you're not allowed to speak. You're not allowed to speak. You shouldn't speak. And whisperings are in the dale, the days of my youth. The poem is about the speaker. It's no longer about the children. That's why it changes from innocence to experience. The days of my youth rise fresh in my mind. My face turns green and pale. Probably an older person feels jealous, feels, you know, green and pale. Not happy that the kids are playing, not happy that the kids are. Then it's not, it's not even an attempt to, to strike a dialogue here, to begin a conversation. It's just taken matter-of-factly. Then come home, my children, the sun is gone down and the dews of night arise. Your spring and your day are wasted in play. And you, yeah, wasted. That's a very negative word. And you winter and night in disguise. The good is yet to come, the bad is yet to come. That's the whole poem. There's no reply from, from the kids. They don't talk back. They're not allowed to speak back. They're, not, they're never taken seriously. Kids are muted. Kids are repressed. And probably two of the most uh, uh, important English poets that were fascinated with the concept of childhood are William Blake and William Wordsworth. Wordsworth says, uh, a child is the father of man. A child is the father. It's paradoxical for what it means. So look at the differences here in, in language. Look at the differences in, in the size, in the dialogue. The most important thing I, I, I like about this poem is the fact that the, the first, the innocence poem includes the dialogue that the kids speaking, having their voice, representing themselves, you know, asking for their right to play, to have fun, to laugh, to run. And that's why the whole poem, the first poem is, is itself musical, if you, if you the, the positive words, the, 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 it's not only the, the kids playing, also nature, the, 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 the sheep, the birds, everything is also happy and singing and dancing with the kids. Is he saying that when kids are playing and happy, everything around will be also happy? But in the second poem, because the kids are not allowed to speak, 
we destroy them, but also we destroy ourselves because we don't see the beauty of the children playing and being innocent. And all we see is green, pale, wasted, green has two and also the skies. Yeah? Green, I think, like, has two indications here. It is, like, gloomy and uh, sad indication, but there, it's, like, green, the like green hills and so the same thing, the thing uh, thank you for noticing this, the, 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 the idea is that this is what innocence and experience, uh, like innocence is usually things viewed from the perspective of children, mostly, of innocence or purity. Experience means like, I don't know, corruption, like uh, it doesn't mean like having more experience, having something that is negative that's destroying your life. You being corrupted by age, by, by life, by the city, by the fact that you have to compete, by conflicts you have around, by the hate you have when you grow up. When you are a kid, you would fight with somebody. But 10 minutes later, you, you're, you're playing again, your friends again. But when you grow up, if you hate somebody, sometimes you hate them forever. Even if you later on realize that, well, it's, it's been some uh, in, uh, insignificant issues, a silly thing. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing the Industrial Revolution because it, it would, it's one reason for why we have the Romantic poets writing the, the poetry they wrote. The Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, we'll talk about this more when we speak about William Wordsworth. So the Industrial Revolution changed life, corrupted life, polluted life. But the Industrial Revolution also brought people from in masses, from the countryside, to the city. <coughs> and when you go to the city, you go to the city, the why? For the experience? Yeah, for, for, the work. for work, okay? For a job, to improve your life, for looking, you know, expecting your dreams to come true. But at that time, when England was becoming the greatest uh, empire of all times, the empire on which the sun never set, the, the, the you know, uh, British armies were, and companies and enterprises, they were bringing raw materials from the colonies, from India, uh, Africa, around the world, and bringing most of them to, to the factories in London, in Liverpool, in Manchester. And these factories needed so many laborers and workers, and they would be leaving the, the, the countryside, the rural areas, hoping for a better life, and they would end up enslaved for, fact, for, for factories. They would end up uh, uh, being controlled, working from uh, eight, 6 or 8 or 7 a.m. until 6 or 8 or 7 or, uh, p.m. And thank you very much. And this is, uh, we'll, we'll quote Chile saying, describing the situation. Similar to the situation we live in, in Gaza nowadays. The poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And again, we always come back to Bernie Sanders saying the 1% and the 99%. So the 1%, uh, the, richer, uh, the, rich, uh, the richest people keep getting rich no matter what. And the poor people are destroying their lives. Look at, the, at Amazon and Jeff Bezos. $180 billion. There was a story the other day about uh, an employee at Amazon who died who just fell, he had a, a heart attack and died, and nobody noticed him for 20 minutes, despite the fact that there are so many people there. And I think his brother said that uh, a week before, uh, this guy uh, mistakenly labeled a different product, and within two minutes, the cameras and the computer managed to, uh, to, to, to find this error and mistake. Two minutes. If you make a mistake for a product, for a thing that brings money, it can be recognized. But when somebody just falls, dies, has a heart attack, a human being is not as important as, as a product that could cost, I don't know, two or three dollars. So, yeah, there is always this in, 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 in uh, romantic poetry. The industrial revolution is always in the background, please. Maybe it's the 
you, you're right, but with the Romantics, even when, with Wordsworth and Coolidge who lived in the countryside, they loved the countryside. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I agree. Like, this, they actually talk about this. This is a feature of Romanticism. They try, they try to defamiliarize the experiences, to rip the veil of familiarity. Uh, when you live, uh, there are flowers and roses and trees and cats and birds around campus here, right? But sometimes, we usually, we don't pay attention. I usually say this, like, uh, when is the last time you, you looked at the moon? It's been ages, because we live in, in concrete buildings. We don't have even a window to the moon, even a crack to the moon. We usually don't see it from our windows from where we live, most often. Very, very few of us would just wait for the moon to look at how big it is, how beautiful it is. Remember when we were kids, we're looking all the time, spend most of our time looking at clouds and what shapes they make. We don't do this now, even if you like nature, because we're busy, we have exams, we have to study, we have reflections to write, we have classes to attend, we have work to do, we have, you know, we need, we, we, we keep rushing, and this is city, this is uh, new, this is life, this is civilization. Therefore, the romantics uh, uh, call for this thing called a childlike experience. We have to, to see everything anew, afresh, every time. And I always, Give the example of the, I mentioned this many times, how the, the little kid, uh, if, you, if you have a kid in the car or something, they would see a donkey and, and then a donkey and then a donkey. You hate the scene yourself. When you see a donkey, it's like, you know, because you are now a grown up, you're civilized. It's like, it's a donkey. In your, but the kid will see, hey, come on, hey, come on, hey, come on, right? Even the light, you know, thou, thou, right? We see this all the time. When kids see stuff, they always, it's as if it is the first time ever to see this. And the romantics want us to go to our, this state of innocence. No corruption, nothing changing or blinding us, nothing keeping us away from. Uh, that's why this is a process of defamiliarizing to rip the, the, the veil of familiarity. We'll see this in, in the daffodils. Daffod we see daffodils, we see flowers around very often, but do we stop to think, not to think actually, to gaze, to enjoy, to imagine? So what are the features of this poetry? What new things can, do you find here in both poems about Blake? Quickly, if you want to come up with a list of five or six or seven features, please. First of all, imagination. Like imagination. Thank you very much. Imagination. Simple language. Simple language, simplicity of language, excellent. Inspira inspiration from what, generally? Nature. What is the source of inspiration? Nature. The rules of decorum? No. The rules of decorum or something else? Nature. Nature, childhood, innocence. Please. Uh, no rigidity of uh, a specific number of or No rigid rooms. I don't, probably free forms of poetry, new forms of poetry rather than free because sometimes we, we talk about this more. Defamiliarization of ordinary mundane experiences. The subject matter could be about anything. It's, it's about a rose. It's about, I don't know, it's about children playing. This wasn't the case with neoclassicism. Childhood is also a feature. They are fascinated with childhood. I, will say something. I think that defamiliarization appears in the word spring, like in the song of experience, he only says uh, your spring and your day. But in the, word, in the song of innocence, he illustrates more and he says like, hell, sky, fly, fly and uh, the birds fly and sheep. So this is how, uh, how children see spring, while this is like, the word spring itself is how adults see spring. So this is That's kind of defamiliarization and childlike it, It's possible, but defamiliarization is basically making familiar things look unfamiliar. Like when you read the daffodils, the, the thousands of daffodils dancing and tossing their heads and like that, that is something like, uh, what's his name, the guy who draws the uh, sunflowers? Uh, Van, 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 Gogh. Van, Gogh. Van, Gogh. Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Like, Van he, drew, he drew like, I'm not sure how many, but hundreds of, of, of these sunflowers. And every time you see them, it's like, look, they look different. It's as if you, you see them for the first time. And I think, I think both, I think both. But yeah, the vision is like, that's the, not only the vision, the vision and the state of innocence. Yes. So here we find that the nurse, the, the nurse also has that childlike vision here, because she's telling children to play, okay, just play, 
the first one. Yeah, the, the nurse. You're thinking about a, uh, a mature person here, not only the children. She has a childlike vision. She supports playing. She thinks it's healthy and it's something that should be done. While the nurse in, in, in the other one in superior sets believe that it's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of no, the, And again, there is no room, no space for kids to express themselves. Yeah, so she doesn't have the childlike vision. So That's right. And, and look at how the kids even, I, I'm imagining a situation where the kids are playing and then this nurse comes and everybody starts sh 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 whispering rather than laughing. So they know her already that she's repressive, she's going to, uh, you know, to oppress them. I'll go through and then finish. I'll go through some of William Blake's fascinating, by the way, uh, if you Google uh, top most influential uh, British people of all time, uh, 100 uh, most influential British people, Blake is on the list. Wordsworth is not. Many people you think of are not on the list. But William Blake is one of the people because he's, he's a pioneer of this movement. Look at what uh, fascinating things. If you, if you are interested in Blake, you could go for more uh, quotes or things. Prisons are built with stones of law. Brothels with bricks of religion. How this man was anti-establishment. In poem, his, po his poem, London, you should read this poem. He, he clearly, openly attacks the establishment, the palace, and the church. How they exploit people, exploit their uh, privileges to destroy people. How the law is turning people into criminals. How religion here is used to turn people Great things are done when men and mountain, mountains meet. Nature. Both read the Bible day and night, but thou read black where I read, or thou read black where I read white. No. He's, he says, a Bible is different, not because the Bible is different, because we are different. If you are open-minded, if you see things, you know, you, you see good things, positive. You look at the, the, the stupid cliche of looking at the half empty of the cup and the half uh, full of the cup. So I re uh, you read black because of your, you know, your mind. Thank you. Your perception. I must, I think this is the most powerful thing you need to learn about William Blake. I must, look at the must here, not should. I must create a system create my own rules, my own constructs, or be enslaved by another man's, or else I'll be enslaved by another man's rules. The three? A, B, possible, it could be common with him, but different from the A, B, B, A, or A, B, A, B. I will not reason, but again, it's not only about the, the rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme is just one indication. I will not reason and compare, like the age of intellectuality, the age of reason, the Augustan age. My business is to create. Yes. By the way, he was, he was a, a famous painter. If you Google his poems and look at uh, Google images, he, uh, he would be doing these engravings and beautiful paintings for his, uh, his poems. They were very expensive. The tree which moves some to tears of joy. Again, look at how he fo focuses on these two states, how experience and understanding our perceptions create the world we live in. In the eyes of others, only a green thing, only a green thing could move you. Something, it happens all the time. You find somebody says something, is telling a story, and some people are like crying their eyes out, and some people are like, Nothing. It means nothing to them. It doesn't mean you're bad. It means this time, this place is not touching something new. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. We see this in Wordsworth, where nature is the theme. In, like some, some people say, Shakespeare is using nature. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? He's saying, you know, summer's day. But he's using nature to ornament his poem, to make his poem as metaphors, as... But here, nature itself is the theme. Imagination itself is the theme. It's not only the medium or the tool. What is now proved was once only imagined. Beautiful. 
What is now proved was once imagined in somebody's imagination. Poetry fitted, I love this very much, again. Poetry, and this clearly shows how he deliberately was saying sorry to the rules of decorum and the neoclassical age. Poetry fitted, poetry that is restrained, restricted by rules, fitters the human race. That's an extreme opinion. If you control poetry, if you repress poetry, restrict poetry, you restrict human race, our imagination and our experiences. Nations are destroyed or flourish in proportion as their poetry, painting, and music are destroyed or flourish. If this feels like somebody in the 20th century, 21st century. Said. This is how ahead of his time he was. This is another uh, extract from a beautiful poem. What he's doing, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. When I tell the truth, it's not for the sake of convincing those who don't know it, but for the sake of defending those that do. When I tell the truth, I don't, it's not for the sake of, of convincing those who don't know the truth, but convincing those who know the truth or who are willing to know the truth. Those who restrain their desires do so because theirs, their desire, is weak enough to be restrained. Desires, imagination, feelings shouldn't be controlled. If the doors, again, the perception issue here, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Cleanse. And again, the city life destroys our perception, makes everything mundane, boring, repetitive. Without contraries, there is no progression. In Arabic, if something is very black, it could sound very black when it's next to very white color or something like this. Very short, very tall, and these things. And that's why he's focusing on these two states of mind. If you don't understand innocence unless there is experience there and vice versa. And finally, this is a very powerful statement, but this shouldn't be six here. I care not whether a man is good or evil. All that I care is whether he is a wise man or a fool. Go put of hol off holiness and put on intellect. Don't disguise under an attire or a mask of religion or goodness or whatever. All I care about is whether you are a good man, a wise man, or a fool. If you are a wise man, like. If you are a fool, I'm stopping here. Uh, okay, I want you to think of possible features for William Blake and his poetry. Read more poetry by William Blake. Many, many students usually approach me and ask me, I want to write poetry, I want to like English poetry, where should I start? I usually point to William Blake. If you want to write poetry, read his many, many, many poems. You're lucky if you're doing also the romantic uh, 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 literature course because you will be exposed to more poems by William Blake. Thank you very much, ladies. If you have a question, you can stay behind.